So, um, I've called this message, Through Heaven's Eyes, Open the Eyes of Our Hearts. So, a lot of what um, Stacey brought today really goes well with what I'm talking on. So, I'm really, really happy. But anyway, I um, wrote this quite a few years ago, actually. And um, it was about a couple of years after I saw the film. And it's a, it a film called The Prince of Egypt. And if anyone's seen it... It's a cartoon, uh, not a cartoon, uh, I don't know what it's, animation, you know, yeah, and a fantastic uh, adaption of the Prince of Egypt, which is obviously about Moses and his life, and part, there's a couple of really, really good songs in it, but there was one song that I, uh, that I felt really jumped in my spirit, and I thought, wow, I've got to, I've got to do a word on this. So I'm going to read you the words, and it goes, a single thread in a tapestry, Though its colour brightly shines, can never see its purpose in the pattern of the grand design. And the stone, sorry, and the stone that sits on the very top of the mountain's mighty face, does it think it's more important than the stones that form the base? So how can you see what your life is worth or where your value lies? You can never see through the eyes of man. You must look at your life. Look at your life through heaven's eyes. A lake of gold in the desert sand is less than a cool fresh spring. And to one lost sheep, a shepherd boy, is greater than the richest king. If a man loses everything he owns, has he truly lost his worth? Or is it the beginning of a new and brighter birth? So how do you measure the worth of a man in wealth or strength or size? In how much he gained or how much he gave, the answer will come. The answer will come to him who tries to look at his life through heaven's eyes. And I thought that was a wonderful song. And if you've never heard it, definitely listen to it. It's a fantastic song. Um, I would have played it for you today, but I couldn't do the chords. It just didn't work. <laughs> I was trying my hardest. I was like, no, that's not going to happen. <laughs> so anyway, what we see is not enough. We need to see what God sees. There is a question running throughout the Bible, a ringing affirmation. Can you see it? Can you see what I am doing? Are you seeing what I see? Nothing is impossible for me. Impossible is not in God's vocabulary. So in Isaiah 43 verse 19, it says, I am creating something new. There it is. Do you see it? I have put roads in the deserts and streams in the thirsty lands. And also 2 Corinthians 5 verse 16 to 20 says, we are careful not to judge people by what they seem to be. Though we once judged Christ in that way, anyone who belongs to Christ is a new person. The past is forgotten and everything is new. God has done it all. He sent Christ to make peace between himself and us and he has given us the work of making peace between himself and others. So we are a new creation. That's it. You know, we are a new creation. God has given us a new blueprint in our, onto our life. You know, what we were before is not what we are today. What we were when we were not Christians is not who we are today. We are a new person and we have to live that new life. We have to live that new, new existence in God and saying, God, you know what? Those things that I struggled with in the past... Yes, they are still there sometimes because they will read their ugly heads. But it's also saying, I'm going to keep moving forward and I'm going to keep um, believing that you are going to change everything in my life. So I'm going to be speaking on uh, three people in the Bible. Um, but I want to talk through a good lot of people in the Bible that, have been, that were changed. And I want you to hear what they were and what they became. So Jacob was known as a deceiver. 
but became the father of the Israelite nation. Joseph, known as a slave, became the savior of his family. Moses, a murderer and a shepherd in exile, became the person who went in God's power to get his people out of Egypt and get the um, Israel nation to the promised land. Gideon, known as a lowly farmer, was to become the deliverer of Israel from Midian. Hannah, known as a housewife, was the mother of Samuel after fervent prayer for a child, and he was a man who was shaped by God into the many roles that he filled, a judge, a priest, a prophet, a counsellor. David, known as a shepherd boy, and last born of the family, became Israel's greatest king. And of course, we know David did much more than that, but there we are. Esther, known as a slave girl, and became a queen. She became a queen, and through deep courage, became the saviour to the Israel generation. Mary, known as a peasant girl, became the mother of our saviour, Jesus Christ. Matthew, known as a tax collector and deeply hated um, and became a disciple of Jesus, an apostle and a gospel writer who still touches people in this generation. Luke, known as a doctor, a Greek physician, he became a disciple of Jesus and a companion of Paul and a gospel writer. Peter, known as a fisherman, and became a disciple of Jesus Christ, an apostle, a leader of the early church, and a writer of two New Testament letters. Paul, one of the greatest, known a killer as a killer and a persecutor, became the most significant person, apart from Jesus, obviously, who shaped the history of Christianity, and he was an apostle wrote many books that we still read and are blessed by today. How amazing is that? You see, all those people throughout the word of God were changed because through heaven's eyes they were more than what man saw. I love the fact that this, this, story, this song sorry, says, so how can you see what your life is worth or where your value lies? You can never see through the eyes of man. Because they will see what only they want to see of you. Uh, he's a, you know, I, I think one of the worst things is to label people. Because I think when we label someone, that is what they become. And I think, I think that when you say, like, um, I'm trying to think of labels, of her over there, you know, and you say something nasty about them, they, that, that may not be them. That may not be them. You know? And I think that's the most important thing. So I'm going to be talking on Jacob today, who was who, humanly known as a deceiver, but through heaven's eyes was the father of the Israelite nation. Before he was even born, God had his plan set out for this little baby, Jacob. He knew this little boy was going to be special. And this little boy had the blueprint to follow before God. So in Genesis 25, verse 21 um, to 23, it says, Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. The Lord answered his prayer, and his wife, Rebecca, became pregnant. The babies jostled each other within her, and she said, Why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and the two people from within you will be separated. One will become stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. So, just so you understand where we're at. Jacob is a twin, okay? So it's Jacob and Esau. So what happens is Jacob 
uh, well, actually, interestingly enough, um, Jacob and uh, Esau were inside the womb, and it says that um, one of them put their hand out first, and I think it was Esau, wasn't it? Was it Esau? And he got the, 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 I'm the older twin, yeah? The first born, yeah. So to explain uh, a little bit of what happened, Jacob got older, and Jacob um, wanted to have the birthright. So he deceived his brother and his father. Twice he deceived, and, um, and he even used his mother's help as well. So if you ever want to read it, it's in Genesis 25. Definitely read it. It's a great story, but um, I'm not going to be able to go over it all today. So anyway, as he grew up, he was not in his brother's league. Esau was a big man, he was, um, and Jacob was very, very weak. Um, it says in Genesis 25, verse 27, the boys grew up and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay home among the tents. Uh, so because he knew of his father's favoritism of Esau, he knew he had to try and get the birthright somehow, so he deceived um, Esau and his dad. So in Genesis 25, verse 31 to 34, it says, Jacob replied, first sell me your birthright. Look, I am about to die, Esau said. What good is this birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore on oath to him selling his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. I think he was uh, dying. At this, it, it, there was illness or something in there. Um, so in Genesis 27 verse 30 is where he deceives his father. And it says, after Isaac finished blessing and Jacob had scarcely left his father's presence. His brother Esau came in from hunting. He too prepared some tasty food and brought it to his father. Then said to him, my father, please sit up and eat some of this game. His father Isaac asked him, who are you? I am your son. He answered, your firstborn. Isaac trembled violently and said, who is it then that hunted game and bought it to me. I ate just before you came. When Esau heard this, his father's words, he burst out with a loud and bitter cry and said to his father, bless me, to me too, my father. But you said your brother came deceitfully and took your blessing. So deception. What does deception mean? It means to... Um, uh, sleight of hand, propaganda. Um, it can employ distraction, camouflage, and concealment. So humanly, people could have seen, when they looked at this man, this, uh, that this young man's life, he was just a deceitful man. He was a liar. Uh, but no, Satan was not going to win this this, uh, this fight with his, this man's life. God was going to win. And what he wanted for Jacob was going to come in. It doesn't matter what we can see. It matters what, we, what God can see. So, so Jacob was not only going to be affluent. His relationship with his brother was going to be restored. So in Genesis uh, 33... Verse 4, there it, is. Uh, it says, Jacob looked up and there was Esau coming with his 400 men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and two female servants. He put the female servants and their children in front, Leah and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph in the rear. He himself went ahead and bowed down to the ground seven times as he approached his brother. But Esau ran to meet Jacob and embrace him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him and they went and they wept. 
And you know what? This is amazing because what happened was Esau went. He was so upset about what Jacob had done. And um, Jacob knew he had to go and say sorry for what he'd done. And he was petrified. He thought, I'm going to have to give everything I own to this man to make him appease him. But he didn't. He threw his arms around him and loved him. And that is the restoring power of God. Is that even though that had happened, that that uh, God had His plan and His plan was taken in. You know, Jacob's sons—they were all t- the twelve sons were the ancestors of the tri- twelve tribes of Israel. The entire nation of Israel came from these men. And of course we know Judah was the father of David and then Jesus came from David. You know, how amazing is that? That these these men, the the things that they did, the things that they uh, went through, that God had a plan for them that would eventually lead to Jesus, our Saviour. How amazing is that? So what is God doing in your life? What is God doing in our church right now? It's great hearing that they're going to be releasing the restrictions. But up until now, it's been hard. It's been tough. It's been really, really strange for us all. We've gone through a time that I don't think any generation has ever gone through. And right now, you could feel like, oh God, where are you in this? Where are you in this when I can't do what I normally do? We can't do everything that we've done in the past. You know, God, what are you doing now? But you know what? God is always doing something new. He's always doing something new. He's always... That's why that verse is in there. And, and, I, and I use it a lot. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Will you not see it? It's there for a reason because we don't always see it. We don't always see what God is doing. We don't always see what we need to see. I'm going to go on to another story, and uh, I love this story. It's in Luke 5, verse 1 to 11, and uh, it's where Jesus calls to his disciples. And it says, one day as Jesus was standing by the lake of uh, Genesis, I can't say that, <laughs> the people were crowding round him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down the nets for the catch. Um, Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. That's amazing. Now, the reason why I say it's amazing is not because of the catch, actually. I'm talking about the man. You see, Peter was a well... He knew fishing. He was a very, very good fisherman. Uh, Simon, I'm sorry, not Peter. Simon. And he was a very, very good fisherman. And this man, he didn't know him. He, he was telling him to do something. He was like, why are you telling me to do something I already know to do? I, I've been fishing for ages. I just want to go home right now. And you know, the, the biggest thing with fishing that we don't realise, or we do realise, but I mean that we probably forget because we've got Tesco's and Asda, is that if he didn't catch fish, they wouldn't have ate that night. Okay, so there were no supermarkets that we can go to whenever we feel like it. That was their dinner. That was their food. So that catch there was a big deal for him. And he was probably really shattered and really annoyed. And at that point there, he could have said, look, mate, 
be quiet over there on the shore. <laughs> what do you know about fishing? But he didn't. He did it. And you know, because he did it, through heaven's eyes, that catch was massive. You see, Jesus can see what we cannot see. You see, my mum recently has been going through a hard time, and I said to her, Mum, listen. I said, listen to me. God can see further in the future than you can. So I rely on him. And when she did, you know what? God changed everything. Because that's the point. We can't see the future. But he can, and he will tell us, right, I don't want you to do that right now. I don't want you to do this right now. I want you to do that right now. And it's about being obedient to what God is asking us to do. And I love this last person I'm going to be speaking on, and we all know her. She's a woman at the well. So we know what happened. Jesus went uh, through an area that Jews never went. And this lady was there, and he asked her to give her water. And she asked for the water that he was talking about, the living water, the water that would never, that you would never thirst again. And of course, Jesus changed her life at that moment. And I love what happens because Jesus changed her life and then she went and became an evangelist. Evangelized the area that she lived in. And they all came to know him. And I think that you, we underestimate ourselves sometimes because we think like a man thinks, like men, like we think um, through man's eyes. I can't do this because I am weak. I can't do this because I am not, uh, I'm just not that type of person. I, I've heard many, many people say, I can't do what I'm doing right now, but I do it because God has called me to do it. But naturally, I'm a very, very shy person. Naturally, I'm a very, very shy person. It took me a long time to become what I am today. And it's because of God. But it, I think we put too much, uh, we put too much, um, where we say to ourselves, I can't be this, and I can't be that, and I can't do this, and I can't do that. But if God wants you to do that, then you will do it. I'm sure that Pastor Dale would say, I never ever thought I would be a pastor. Because you never, you did, you, you said many times, you never thought it, you were a bad boy. But God changed his heart. And in so doing, through heaven's eyes, he became a pastor, which it, years and years ago, if he looked at himself, he would be thinking, that would never have been me. And that's the same as me, and that's the same as you. God has called you to be something. God has given you something. We're not all going to be the father of the Israelite nation. No, we're not all going to be kings like David. But there are things that God wants us to do that I think sometimes we say, I, I can't do that. And we put a lid on it and we screw that lid really, really tight and we say, no, 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 I, I can't do that. I remember uh, someone I was speaking to, he said, I told God I'm not going to um, a, a different country. I don't know where it was. And the exact country he said, I am not going to, God sent him. <laughs> because you can't tell God I'm not. <laughs> if God wants you to do it, then that is what you're going to do. And so the woman at the well, uh, through her eyes, and, uh, and she became um, a saviour to those people. And I think that that is beautiful. That, that moment of change that happened between her and Jesus where Jesus showed her yes, her sin but yes, that she could be something else. We're all sinners fallen short of the glory of God yes. We're all human, yes but God can change anything He can do anything with anyone 
So I want to end again with just reading the promise out that I read, that I felt was just really, really good. It's in uh, Deuteronomy 8, and it says, Keep and live out the entire commandment that I am commanding you today, so you will live and prosper and, enter you, and own the lands that God promised you to your ancestors. Remember every road that God led you on for those 40 years in the wilderness, pushing you to the limits, testing you so that he would know that you were made of, what you were made of, whether you were, would keep his commandments or not. He put you through hard times, he made you hungry, then he fed you with manna, something neither you nor your parents knew anything about. So you would learn that men and women don't live by bread alone. We live by every word that comes from God's mouth. Your clothes didn't wear out and your feet didn't blister those 40 years. You you learnt deep in your heart that God disciplines you in the same way as a father disciplines his child. So it's paramount that you keep the commandments of God your God, walk down the roads he shows you and reverently respect him. God is about to bring you into a good land, a land with brooks and rivers, springs and lakes, streams out of the hills and through the valleys. It's a land of wheat and barley, of vines and figs and pomegranates and olives, oil and honey. It's a land where you will never be hungry. Always food on the table and roof over your head. It's a land where you'll get iron out of rocks and mine copper from hills. After a meal satisfied, bless God, your God, for the good land he has given you. Make sure you don't forget God, your God, by not keeping his commandments, his rules. And I absolutely love that. God has something more. You know, when we are going through what we've gone through, COVID made us think, is this it? God says, no, this is not it. This is a new beginning. You see, I was watching something recently, and I can't remember uh, who the guy was, but he really touched my heart because he said, you know what? That what has happened now has changed everything in a way that allows God to come in in a different way. The way we've done church for so long is changing. Not free man. This is not man's work. This is God's work. God is changing his church from the inside out. And we have to just flow with it. We can't, if we can't, you know, if you're going to stay in one place and you're going to just get stuck, in that one place, because God is saying, no, 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 I'm always moving. I'm always moving forward. I'm always going forward. I'm always moving on. You need to come with me. Jump into that water. I love, um, I think it's Ezekiel, I'm not sure, where the river, where he jumps in, and he gets fully into the river. That's what we need to do. We need to be people that say, through heaven's eyes, I'm going to open the eyes of my heart, because, Lord, what you are doing, I want that. I want more of that. Thank you.